Good morning and welcome to Cedardale Church of the Nazarene in Pepperla, Georgina, Ontario. My name is Carol Moran and I am president of Nazarene Mission International. I will be telling you a little bit about it in a few seconds. We want to thank you for this for this day. We want to thank you for your support of the church. Without you, we would not be open today. We thank you for supporting this ministry. We want to thank God for his many blessings and his grace that he has sent to you to support us. We pray for you, we love you, and we keep our doors open for you. During the time of chaos, economic and political unrest, the Nazarene Church is responding to the community to offer human kindness, to offer peace, to offer stability, to offer direction, to be the conscience of the nations. We have the answer. The answer is to turn to God. On August the 4th, 2020, a devastating explosion ripped through the main port of Beirut, Lebanon, leveling the sections of the city and leaving about 200 people dead and injuring 6,500 persons. Over 300,000 are estimated to be homeless, and the damage from the explosion is estimated to be about $15 billion US. Many have lost their jobs and the economy of the country has collapsed, devaluating the money the people did have and leaving the country traumatized. The Nazarene people were there before the explosion, during the explosion, and after the explosion. And what they did was they repaired 75 houses, distributed food to 450 families, and milk boxes for the children of 200 families. They distributed hot meals for 100 people for seven consecutive days. They facilitated a mobile clinic for about 500 people and distributed medicine, nylon sheets and flashlights for 300 families. They provided trauma counseling for 100 children and 50 adults. They carried out repairs to three churches and to the schools. Now there is some praise in this too. Though the properties were damaged and church members and children in our school in Beirut were not seriously injured by the blast. The Church of the Nazarene has been able to provide food, clothing, medicine for the most vulnerable. The Nazarene schools in Beirut have been able to continue to provide education for the students and a place for learning for many refugee children who had no access due to their status. And during the COVID-19 pandemic, the local Nazarene churches have been able to maintain connections with their congregants and the refugees, as well as offering hope and comfort. We ask you to pray for the Beirut, the Lebanon people, the churches. We ask you to pray for our directors. We pray that they will be taken care of and people will be like, their, like the Nazarenes there to help them. We pray for courage for them. We pray for their country also, that they will have a stable government. We ask you to pray for all countries, for the Nazarenes are in 163 countries now. A word of encouragement. The Lord will comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning and a garment of praise instead, instead of a spirit of despair. That was written by Isaiah 61, verse 3. We ask you and thank you for your support. We ask God to bless you and keep you. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. I'm so glad you're with us this morning, and it's a wonderful day today, and we're going to have a wonderful message to uh wonderfully uh, build our soul on today. Well, welcome wherever you are from Georgina, Perfola, or other parts of Ontario or around the world. I want to invite you today to uh, this service and to enjoy a wonderful message. Today's message is called The Limitless Barrel, and it's based on 1 Kings chapter 17, verses 8 to 16. And uh, it's about the widow and Elijah. We have some thoughts for us today, and so I have this wonderful truth from Isaiah 41, verse 10. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. 
I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Jesus himself said, for with God, nothing is impossible. And that is still true today as when he said it. Matthew 6.33 says, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the gift of this day. We thank you for the opportunity that we can serve you. We thank you that we can be your hands and your feet, Lord. And we ask that you would wonderfully guide us through these days ahead. And we ask that your grace be upon us, grace be with us, and uh, we would shed the love of Christ in our hearts abroad to everyone we meet. Father, we ask for your success. We ask for your goodness and mercy at this time. And we pray that your work would be done your way. And we ask for mighty things to happen, that the salvation of many souls would come to you today and throughout this week. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me read for you the wonderful story as it's recorded for us in 1 Kings chapter 17, 8 to 16. So then the word of the Lord came to him saying, Arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. See, I have commanded a widow there to provide for you. So he arose and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, indeed a widow was there gathering sticks. And he called to her and said, Please bring me a little water in a cup that I may drink. And as she was going to get it, he called to her and said, Please bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. So she said, As the Lord your God lives, I do not have bread, only a handful of flour in a bin and a little oil in a jar. And see, I'm gathering a couple of sticks so that I may go in and prepare it for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. And Elijah said to her, Do not fear. Go and do as you have said. And make me a small cake from it first, and bring it to me, and afterward make some for yourself and your son. For thus says the Lord God of Israel, The bin of flour shall not be used up, nor shall the jar of oil run dry, until the day the Lord sends rain on the earth. So she went away and did according to the word of Elijah. And she and her, and, and her household ate for many days. The bin of flour was not used up, nor did the jar of oil run dry, according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke by Elijah. Let me tell you now the true story that happened in my life, and I'll recount it for you as best as I can recall it, that in January of 2006, I was hired on as a frontline worker at the Salvation Army Sutton Youth Shelter. All was going fine. It was a great job and a great position until March of that same year, when Kathy, our acting director, called me into her office. While I was in her office, she asked me a very pointed question, and she said this, Grant, why are you doing what you're doing? And so I was stunned. I said, well, I'm, I'm working as a frontline worker. She said, no, why are you a frontline worker and not our chaplain here in this, in this shelter? I said, well, Kathy, the hours uh, in the frontline position are sufficient for me to keep my family and I alive and, su and surviving. The, the hours offered in the other position, the chaplaincy, are not enough. Like, I can't, I can't survive. She said, well, Grant, if I'm able to work on that, would you be willing to put your name in as chaplain here? And I said, yes, put my name down. Well, that was March, April, our acting director, Kathy, left. And now the shelter was without no director. We went through the whole spring, summer, and into the early parts of the fall of that same year with no director. I had forgotten about that discussion nearly and forgotten that I had put my name in for that position. But in November of 2006, our new acting director, Rochelle, called me into her office on a wonderful sunny afternoon in the end of November. She said, Grant, I need to see you urgently. It's so important, you must come to my office. The first thing I thought about was how dreadful this sounded 
and I started to panic and really start to fret that something bad was in the wings. <laughs> well, I no sooner sat down in her office and she said, Grant, I have good news and I have bad news. I said, whoa, okay, what's the bad news? She said, Grant, as of today, officially, I relieve you of your capacity as frontline worker. Oh, no. Oh, that, those are words I just did not want to hear at that moment. But then she said, here's the good news. I said, what's the good news? She said, today I officially take you on as chaplain of the Salvation Army Sutton Youth Shelter. I said, really? She said, yes. So I said, that's amazing. She said, no, that's not just amazing. Here's what's amazing. I said, what? She said, this position was put in in March, just as Kathy had done. But it went through all this time. It went through 148 countries, 138 countries, in all the ministry units and available to all the personnel that works in the Salvation Army worldwide. And here's the stunning thing. I said, what? She said, your name was the only name that was put on the list. Your name is the only name that was responding to this position. I said, really? She said, yes. Well, what I learned from that friend is much what we're going to learn today in today's message. If God has a place for you, he will prepare it but he'll prepare the place as much as he'll prepare the person. And so those things I have truly learned out of my own life. And it is with great joy and great gladness I submit this wonderful message to you today called The Limitless Barrel. This is such an amazing story that it is amazing in every way. The stories preserved in the first book of Kings about the prophet Elijah are some of the most gripping tales in all of history. This biblical history focuses on a three-year drought brought on by the dark days of apostasy of King Ahab and his evil wife Jezebel and the people of Israel. The physical drought paralleled their spiritual part bankruptcy and denial and opposition and their worship of Baal. The whole land was apostate and swarmed with debased and abhorrent priests of Baal. The denial of the kingship of the Lord brought on terrible judgment famine, starvation, weakness, and yes, even death. The book of Kings begins with the eminent death of King Solomon, of King David, I mean, and the succession dispute it precipitates, which is resolved when Solomon becomes king. Key events of Solomon's reign, the building of the temple and the visit of Queen of Sheba and his ultimate idolatry occupy the first 11 chapters. Then Solomon's son Rehoboam, refuses to lighten the burden of conscripted labor on his subjects. There's a civil war. The kingdom is divided, and Jeroboam takes over the rule of the northern kingdom, which is Israel, in contrast to the southern kingdom, which is Judah. From then on, the book alternates between accounts of the northern kings and the southern kings. In our story today, the kings of Israel, or the northern kingdom, are very wicked, and Jeroboam, having set up golden calves right away, being more interested in politics than in faithfulness to the Lord God. But King Ahab is the worst, and he begins to reign just before the beginning of this story, and that's in 1 Kings 16. His first acts are to marry Jezebel, a Sidonian or Phoenician princess, and build an altar to the Canaanite storm god Baal in the capital in Samaria to accommodate his wife's pagan religion. Then the text tells a story about the rebuilding of Jericho, which is in fulfillment of a curse back in Joshua chapter 6, was rebuilt at the cost of the builder's sons. Elijah is commanded to go to Zarephath, which is not in Israel. It is a Sidonian city between Tyre and Sidon on the coast. Elijah will have a long walk from Zarephath, from the Wadi Cherith. While he is staying with the widow, her son will die, and Elijah will bring him back to life. Then it will finally be time for the drought to end. Elijah will do battle with the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel, involving massive amounts of water, a miracle in itself considering the drought that was in the land. And then Elijah flees from wicked Jezebel to the wilderness, where he will hear the still small voice. And then he will pick up his apprentice, Elisha. War follows as well as the official corruption that seals the doom of Ahab's monarchy. 
The book of Kings traces the histories of two sets of kings and the two nations of disobedient people, Israel and Judah, both of whom were growing indifferent to God's law and his prophets and were headed towards horrendous captivity. The writer establishes early in the, his narrative that the Lord required obedience by the kings to the Mosaic law if their kingdom was to receive his blessing. Disobedience would bring exile. The sad reality that history revealed was that all the kings of Israel and the majority of the kings of Judah did evil in the sight of the Lord. These evil kings were apostates and betrayers who led their people to sin by not confronting adultery, but by sanctioning it and approving it. Because of the king's failure, the Lord sent his prophets to confront both the monarchs and the people with their sin and their need to return to him. Because the message of the prophets was rejected, the prophets foretold that the nation would be carried into exile. Like every prophecy uttered by the prophets and kings, this word from the Lord came to pass. Oh, friends, and therefore the kings interpreted, or the book of kings interprets the people's experience of exile and helps them to see why they had suffered God's punishment for gross idolatry. It also explains that just as God had shown mercy to Ahab and Jehoiachin, he was willing to show them mercy as well. Theological themes are stressed in this wonderful book. First, the Lord judged Israel and Judah because of their disobedience to the law. This unfaithfulness on the part of the people was furthered by the apostasy of the evil kings who led them into abhorrent idolatry. We soon learn leadership is important. Secondly, we learn that the word of the prophets came to pass. This confirmed that the Lord did keep his word. We learned uh, the warnings and the dire impending judgments are going to come. And thirdly, we learned that the Lord remembers his promise to David. Even though the kings of the Davidic line proved themselves to be disobedient to the Lord, the Lord does not bring David's family to an end, as he did the families of Jeroboam, Omri, and Jehu. Even as the book closes, the line of David still exists. Praise God. And so there is hope for the coming seed of David. Throughout, the Lord is seen as faithful, and his word is trustworthy. He perfects what he starts, and he is forever eternally the same, as it says in Psalm 102. The God of Israel is the God of the whole earth and all its peoples. And the root issue is whose word a person truly trusts and whose instruction a person will truly follow. First, let us consider God's divine love. The prophet Habakkuk reminds us, in the midst of wrath, God remembers mercy. Habakkuk 3.2 God God's love is discernible, even when it shines in the midst of judgments. In the present instance, God had sent an all-consuming famine upon the lands of Israel and Sidon. The two peoples had provoked the Most High, the one renouncing him, and the other by sending forth their queen Jezebel to teach idolatry in the midst of Israel. God therefore determined to withhold the both the dew and the rain from the polluted lands. But while he did this, he took care that his own chosen ones would be secure. Did you know that despite all the books be, bring, being dry, there was one reserved for Elijah? God preserves him and the 7,000 that did not bow the knee to Baal in 1 Kings 19. We learn from this story that come what may, God's people are safe. If the world is to be burned with fire, if convulsions shake the earth and its pillars tremble and the sky is divided in two, yet amid all the wreck of this world, the believers shall be as secure in the calmest hour of rest. Let us be confident then when we hear of wars and rumors of wars, said Jesus. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me, he said. Whatever comes upon the earth beneath the wings of Jehovah, we are secure and have a refuge. Psalm 91.4 Live upon his promise. Live in his faithfulness and bid defiance to the blackest future. For with God, nothing is impossible. Our Savior teaches us when he says, I tell you of a truth, many widows were in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, when great famine was throughout the land, but unto none of them was Elijah sent, except the, the widow in Zarephath, 
Oh, here is a divine love, my friends. When God chooses a widow, it was not one of his own from the favored race of Israel, but someone doomed to be utterly cut off. Here was divine love in one of its sovereign manifestations. So many are always quarreling with God because he will not submit his will to theirs. If God was not absolute, men would think themselves gods. But God is absolute, sovereign in all his ways, and is hated because this humbles us and makes us bow before a Lord, a king, a master, who will do as he appoints and as he elects. If God would choose kings and princes, then men would and men and women would swoon over this idea. He would make if he would make his chariot stay at the door of nobles, if he would step from his throne and give mercy only to the great, the wise and the learned, then there might be heard the shout of praise to a God who honors the fine doings of man. But this is very important. He chooses the base things of the world and the things which are despised, God has chosen. And the things which are not to bring down the things that are, 1 Corinthians 1, 28. Throughout scripture, we are constantly startled with resplendent instances of divine love. And the case of this widow is one among the many. God's love journeys beyond the borders of Canaan to cherish and preserve a widow of Zarephath. We find in the scriptures that the publicans and harlots enter into the kingdom of heaven while the self-righteous Pharisee is shut out. God picks up some of his brightest jewels from the most unlikely of places. While among the great and learned, there are very few who bow the knee to the God of all. Friends, if God intends to bless, he looks not to what you are. He finds his motive in the depth of his own wonderful heart and not in you. He, in continuing to regard this widow, we notice that her condition was miserable. She not only suffers the famine which had fallen upon her and her neighbors, her husband was taken from her and she was left with no inheritance. Friends, this is just where God love finds us all, in the depth of poverty and misery, not just temporal poverty, but spiritual distress and poverty of soul also. So long as the jar of oil is full to overflowing, we shall never taste the mercy of God, for God will not fill us until we are emptied of self. We need to look away from ourselves and look up to God who sits on the throne of grace. And there we discover a God of unfailing love. Look to the cross, my friends. He who hangs there died for each of us. As we are, those veins were open for sinners utterly ruined and undone. The agony he suffered was for those who feel an agony of heart like yours and mine. His griefs he meant for the grievers, and his mourning has made his atonement for the mourners. Here we see divine love manifested for us. Secondly, let us consider the grace of God. When Elijah enrolls in the school of the limitless barrel, he meets a widow and asks that she bring him a drink of water and make him a little cake. The text is tailored to teach us even today in this 21st century that when one door closes, we serve a God who can and will open another door and we must trust him by faith. The key to opening the door is faithfulness and obedience in every age, in every time, in every generation. Grace is poured out on this widow in a marvelous way. Her circumstances are exceedingly trying. And the first thing she hears is a trial. Give away some of that water which you, which you and your son need so most and give it to me. Trust me and lean not on your own understanding. Then give away a portion of that last cake which you intend to eat. All through these circumstances, it was a trial of faith and trust. For God's grace is sufficient for you. For my power is perfected in weakness, as it says in 2 Corinthians 12, 9. Friends, the barrel was not used up, nor did the jar of oil run dry. Faithfulness and obedience to God are always important, and it always leads to the blessings of Almighty God. They are new every morning, as the prophet says in Lamentations 3. There is always daily grace for daily trials, if we trust him. The daily journey to the well of mercy, seeking God's grace, is always good for us. The hand of faith is blessed by the exercise of knocking at the gate. Jesus said, give us this day our daily bread. And this is an exceptional prayer to depend on God for his gracious provision. 
Oh, for grace to seek first the kingdom of heaven and commune with our Father who art in heaven. For you know the grace of the Lord Jesus, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. 2 Corinthians 8, 9. But when we think I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind and naked, this is a sad plight indeed. Revelation 3, 17. We learn a vital truth here. We will never have a double quantity of oil at one time. It will always be the right amount. There will be nothing left over, but there will be none lacking. God's grace and his wonderful provision are always right and always accurate. The faithfulness of Almighty God and the riches of his grace were enough, are always enough, and still enough. The barrel of flour was not used up, nor did the jar of oil run dry, according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke by Elisha in 1 Kings 17, 16. He is God. He changes not. He will not forsake you. He is God. He lies not. He cannot leave you. He is sworn by himself because he can, he can swear by no greater than by two immutable things, his oath and his promise. We might have a strong consolation because of this. Hebrews 6, 18. We who, who have fled to this wonderful refuge and can lay hold on the hope of God that is set before us. Though the barrel of flour holds a scanty supply and though the jar of oil contains just a drop the flour last to the end, and the jar of oil miraculously multiplied hour by hour is totally sufficient. God loves us, and he cannot cease to love us, friends. He will preserve in whatever troubles and temptations we encounter. He is faithful, and he is the only one who abounds in great faithfulness, as he himself says in Exodus 34, verse 6. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I believe it, and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. 2 Timothy 1.12 That is the glory of trusting Christ. That he not only forgives, but he tells you so. He sheds abroad in our hearts a sweet awareness of acceptance in him. Which by trusting in Christ you will know better than if the angel Gabriel told you himself. That you are now one of the family of God by faith in him. If you confess your sin and believe him by faith, that all your sins are covered by his grace and gone, and that every good thing is yours by his everlasting covenant. Now, this is an interesting part, and I want you to take note of what's coming now. And so you will, might need a highlighter in Psalm 107. The psalmist tells us, those who go down in the, to the sea in ships, who do business on great waters, they see the works of the Lord and his wonders in the deep. For he commands and raises the stormy wind, which lifts the waves of the sea. They mount up to the heavens. They go down again to the depths. Their soul melts because of trouble. They reel to and fro and stagger like a drunken man and are at their wit's end. Psalm 107, 23 to 27. Perhaps you've already arrived at wit's end, my friend. The widow in our story was at her wit's end, for she wanted to die, it says so in our text. The nation of Israel was at its wit's end because of gross idolatry. And guess what? There are many churches and so many people today, right now, who are at wit's end. Life's troubles seem to come one at a time. They're like the waves in a storm, coming one after another, fast and furious, mounting higher and higher. It's as if the sun has gone down and the air has turned cold and the winds of trouble have begun beating down. Like the sailors in Psalm 107, your soul is melted because of trouble. Actually, the Hebrew means melted or fainting with fear. Please note that God is not surprised or bewildered by your circumstance or ordeal. In fact, it's happening because he wants to produce something in your heart to reveal his glory in you. You may feel it is the absolute worst storm in your life. Your trial might be a financial trial, business troubles, slander, financial problems, or a personal tragedy. You may even go to bed at night with a restlessness inside, a cloud hanging over you. When you awaken, this dull ache is still with you, 
And it keeps hanging on to one day you wake up crying, Lord, how much more do I have to endure? How long will you allow me to go through this? When will this all end? When did the storm stop for the sailors in Psalm 107? When did God bring them to their desired safe haven? According to the psalmist, two things happened. First, the sailors came to their wit's end, giving up on all human help or hope. They said, there's no way we can save ourselves. Nobody on earth can get us out of this. But secondly, here it is. They cried to the Lord in the midst of their trouble, turning to him alone for help. If you are a child of God, if you're set on allowing him to mold you into the image of the only begotten son, then your battle won't stop until you give up trying to figure it all out on your own and leaning on your own understanding. You must show yourself completely and wholly into God's great care until he has accomplished his eternal purposes in you. Your troubles will only continue if you refuse to entirely trust him. God keeps bringing us to wit's end until we learn to trust him completely, no matter how hopeless things may seem or appear. We see this time and again with the children of Israel in the wilderness. Again and again, God brings them to wit's end to test them to see if they would trust him. But each time they refused and repelled him. Let me remind us today, there is no problem you have that he can unravel or resolve. God brought Israel to wit's end to develop a holy faith in him and not the, 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 the false truth and false gods of the pagan nations around them. May we all surrender our wills and our personal agendas when we come to this place called wit's end. May it become a place of renewed faith, holy trust, and holy hallowed conviction in our loving Heavenly Father. Thomas of Villanova was a great preacher in the 1500s. He said, I quote, the chief requirement is a heart that is fully determined to serve God, one that is ready to break with anything that impedes it. Regarding this famine of faith, everyone else felt that the Lord was dead or dormant or not worth following at all. But for Elijah the Tishbite, the Lord lived. He was supreme and the ultimate reality of Elijah's life Supreme confidence and assurance in God's goodness and provision in the, the face of despair and doubt comes from knowing that God loves us. James 1.17 Let us never lose sight of the fact that the same events that test us often become the means by which God is able to use us to, in ministry to others. In other words, our trials often become vehicles of ministry, opportunities to manifest the life of Jesus Christ and the reality of the power of God. This is precisely what we see in this episode of Elijah's life. Christ's likeness means that even in our pain, we are to think of others and how God may want to use us. This goes totally against the grain of human nature and especially against our self-centered society. Please note, this is so important. I need everyone to hear me on this. This is so important. Elijah did not move until there was communion with God. Elijah did not even take one step until there was communion with God. This is very important for everyone across Canada who's a Christian to know. He waited until he had direction from the Lord his God. He moved at the word of the living God. For Elijah, all scripture is given by inspiration and is probable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Then, as now, the Lord never, never leads us contrary to his word. We must never get our eyes on the instrument or the conditions. We must look beyond the circumstances to the real supply who is God. Often God chooses the despised and the small or he reduces our resources to teach us he is really the one who supplies as is found for us in Judges chapter 7 when he reduces the army of Israel from 32,000 to 300 to fight a gigantic Midianite army. Our story today teaches God can use any of us. He can take whatever we have and multiply it many times over just as he did with the meager resources of the widow or as Jesus took the blows and the fish and fed 5,000. 
Friend, hear me here. Are you in a condition where you, you, where you can hear God's voice or his instructions? What are you facing in your life right now that needs God's supply? Are you trusting him for your needs? Where is your focus? Are you focused on the problem rather than the Lord? Today, the solid word, the teaching of the word is in jeopardy, says Barna Research, that the church is rotting from the inside out, crippled by a lack of theology. Today, consumer-like issues and unbiblical philosophies have invaded the church, and despite the fact our nation may have many steeples, like then it is today, there is a famine in our land, not a famine of food and water, but of the proclamation of the word of the living God. God wants our first fruits, not our scraps and our leftovers. How many miracles are we missing out on today because we don't think that we have enough that God can use? How many miracles are we missing out on today because we allow fear to freeze our faith? Because sin in Israel was going was so rampant, there was a famine in the land, and it affected everybody. We need to realize and understand that when we sin, sin affects the blessings from God. And yes, God withheld the rain from Israel because of sin. And I'll say it again, because of sin, not a mistake, sin. And he will withhold blessings and will cause famines to come upon the land to get our attention and our devotion. We all need to trust him. You Through faith, God can turn any situation around. You see, through God, a little money becomes much money. A little faith becomes much faith. A little strength becomes much strength. The barrel becomes limitless because of God's grace. Little becomes much when God is in it. Because with God, burdens become blessings. Prisoners become pardoned. Gloom becomes grace. Oil becomes overflowing. And sinners become saints when we trust God. And why is this? Why is this? Because Jesus died on a blood-soaked cross on a mountain called Calvary. They placed him in a borrowed tomb. But Sunday morning he got up with all the power in his hand and he took the little we had and he gave us a lot. Remember the ancient promise. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Friend, may we all trust him more than we did yesterday and trust him wholeheartedly and unreservedly. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for your goodness. Oh, Lord, we need your help. This is a nation that needs your help. We know so many nations around this world that are, that are at wit's end. There are many people at wit's end because they've given up on you. They're not following you. They've repelled you. They've repulsed you. They've done whatever they can to you. But Lord God, we need you. We need you now. The church needs you more than ever. We all need to come to this wonderful place and ask for help in time of need and ask for your grace that the, that the strength of the living God would come back, that it's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts, that you would do something in our day, a marvelous thing in our day called revival and bring people back from the brink of destruction, O oh God. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord willing, I'll see you next week. God bless you.